Thanks, Janine. Appreciate that. Good evening, you guys. Good to see you. Hope you guys had a good uh, afternoon. Um, I don't think there's anything to draw attention to from this morning. I think everybody, everything got covered. I, I haven't heard how the baby uh, is doing, the Renner baby. Um, I told them that I was praying for them on Saturday morning. She went into the hospital to be induced. They had it scheduled and everything. And when I e texted them, they said, we're just getting admitted and getting settled. So I don't know anything s since then. I'm assuming no news is good news and that the mom and baby are doing fine and maybe even home already how speedily they like to get moms out of the hospital and back into their own home. So they might actually be at home um, and make sure if you haven't signed up for the meal thing and you intended to, make sure you do that. I haven't looked to see if there's spots available, but uh, if there is, we'd like to bless them and serve them if we can't. So uh, with that, why don't we stand together? Uh, worship is a place in which what we long for is given to us. The very reason we were created and made was to be in God's presence uh, and to see him face to face. And so many of the Psalms convey that. So we're going to use Psalm 84 again. We used this last week because we had referenced it in the sermon. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly? O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. I hope you are here to draw near to God. I hope you are here to taste and see that he is good uh, and that you long for his presence and his love. So let's rejoice in him. Let's give thanks. We're going to sing the first four stanzas of 62. Sing to the Lord. Hymns number 62, the first four stanzas.
Let's pray together. Our God, as we draw near to you yet again this evening, draw near to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in this, the time of our trouble, to plead for your love and your kindness to be made known and manifest, to be filled with the Spirit of Christ, that we might call you Father, that we might address you as Father, that we may love you and serve you and bless you. But as we draw near, we have to ask, who are we? How is it that we can minister in your presence when there are cherubim and seraphim who cover their feet, who fly, who cover their face and shield themselves from your glory, who with purity ceaselessly cry out to you, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Who are we that we might draw near to you with unveiled face? That we might speak to you face to face in Jesus Christ. Father, it is only your mercy. It is only your love. It is only your goodness which enables us to be where we are. Bless us and keep us, make your face to shine upon us. Transform us that we might be like our Savior. Empower and inflame our worship as we lift up our hearts and our voices to you, offering all we have, all that we are, and all that we do. Hear us, we pray, in Christ's holy name. Amen. You can be seated. Let's continue to sing, continue to worship, and to bless the Lord, singing him 701, 701, redeemed how I love to proclaim it.
And now 648, my Jesus, I love thee. 648. Please pray with me. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, <clears throat> his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Lord God, <clears throat> with the psalmist, we would sing a new song. 
we declare your glory, your marvelous works. You are almighty, having made the heavens and all that we see around us by the power of your word. Splendor and majesty are before you. Strength and beauty are in your sanctuary. And we do tell of your salvation. We come as those in desperate need of salvation. Our sins are daily. We do make and we serve idols. Our desires and our preferences rule over us. We do not speak the truth with our neighbor. We sin in our anger. But we come, Lord Jesus, rejoicing in your obedience. You have adopted us and we have redemption through your blood. We pray, Holy Spirit, for your continued work in us, that we would be imitators of God as beloved children. Father, we give you thanks for Covenant Church, the body that you are building and uniting. Pray that our worship might bring you glory. We ask that our times of fellowship and service to each other would be encouraging. Bless Pastor Mark, his preaching, and his times of preparation. Grant diligence to him in studying your word. We pray for Pastor Dan, that you would open doors for him for continued service to you in educating and teaching others. Oh, we also pray for a job for Herb, for your encouragement for Herb and Leslie in this time. And we do pray for healing for those of us struggling with seasonal colds and flu, that you would grant healing. We pray that you'd grant Tim Arndt increased mobility and bless Sherry as she cares for him. Well, we pray for David and for Miranda for their time away at college. Grant them diligence and understanding in their classes and their assignments. Pray their attendance at worship service was, would be encouraging and bless their times of fellowship with friends. Father, we ask for your blessing on the installation service of Pastor Farr at the new Klamath Falls Church in Oregon. Pray that this event would be a great encouragement to the saints who have been gathering there. Give them a refreshing time of fellowship with the others from the Presbytery who travel there. Bless Pastor Mark as he brings the sermon to this service. And we pray for First OPC in Portland, that you would raise up a new pastor for them as Pastor Farr begins his labors there at the Klamath Falls. Grant insight, diligence to the search committee, that you would bring a man there to serve. Father, we give thanks for the good report from Pastor Lopez at Iglesia Presbyteriana Sola Escritura in Puerto Rico. We pray that the five people signed up for the new members class would be encouraged in their faith and be eager to join the church. And bless that congregation's focus this winter and the spring on evangelizing in their community and making new contacts. Pray that you'd open doors that they might be able to readily share the gospel. And we ask you to bless their plans to host a vacation Bible school this summer, that there would be a short-term missions team that would be willing to travel there and to assist with the program. Father, we thank you that Sam Folta was able to return to China to have good fellowship with the young churches and to attend their presbytery meeting. We give thanks that the three licentiates were able to be ordained. We pray for Pastor R's ministry at Speak the Truth Church. The gospel might be faithfully proclaimed and the congregation diligently shepherded. We pray that the training of ruling elders throughout the presbytery could continue, that men might be prepared to labor alongside the pastors. Father, we do pray for those in authority, for President Biden, for the Congress, for Governor Inslee, for our state authorities and our local authorities. May they serve truthfully so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We pray for those in the judicial system as well, from the Supreme Court to the local courts. May decisions reflect truth in the varying circumstances. Father, go with us in this week. Encourage us in our service to our families, our employers, our neighbors. Help us to be diligent, to be faithful in our labors. We pray that your steadfast love would be the source of our daily hope. In Jesus, our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 61 in the back of the hymnal, Psalm 61. Page 806.
Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Amen. Well, let's prepare our hearts to hear God's word, to receive that word, to reflect on it. Let's do that by standing. Let's sing hymn 163 at the name of Jesus. 163. Let's stand together.
You can be seated. As you're finding your seat, you're welcome to join me in Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah 2. I'm going to read the middle section of that to the end. So kind of the second half. What I want you to notice, which I'll, I'll draw attention to, is the seven statements that Israel says. But you say, or you said, um, those are sort of going to be um, some of the things that we talk about tonight. So Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 20 like I said, this is coming in the middle of uh, an oracle, and um, Israel's response to the word that Jeremiah is bringing. So, uh, let's receive this word, let's open up our ears, our hearts to hear the voice of Christ, the voice of the Spirit speaking, that we might receive it, and with it, all that God might have for us tonight. For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and every green tree you bowed down like a whore, yet I planted you a choice vine holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me declares the Lord God. How can you say, I am not unclean? I have not gone after the bales. Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. A restless young camel running here and there, a wild donkey used to the wilderness, in her heat sniffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need weary themselves. In her month they will find her. Keep your feet from going ashod and your throat from thirst. But you said, it is hopeless, for I have loved foreigners, and after them I will go. As a thief is shamed when caught, so the house of Israel shall be shamed. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, who say to a tree, you are my father, And to a stone you gave me birth, for they have turned their back on me and not their face, back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they say, arise, save us. But where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in your time of trouble. For as many as your cities are your gods, O Judah, why are you Why do you contend with me? You have all transgressed against me, declares the Lord. In vain I have struck your children. They took no correction. Your own sword devoured your prophets like a ravening lion. And you, O generation, behold the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Why then do my people say, we are free. We will come no more to you. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. How well you direct your course to seek love, so that even the wicked women you have taught your ways, also on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. You do not find them breaking in, yet in spite of all these things, you say, I am innocent. Surely his anger has turned Turned from me. Behold, I will bring you to judgment for saying, I have not sinned. How much you go about changing your way. You shall be put to shame by Egypt as you were put to shame by Assyria. For it too will come away with your hand on your head. For the Lord has rejected those in whom you trust and you will not prosper by them. Let's pray together. Father, turn our faces to you and not our backs. 
that you might speak to us as a man speaks with his friend that we might be humbled by you, that we might be humbled by your kindness and goodness and love, that we might be humbled by how you open yourself up to us, even to be shamed and humiliated by us and our behavior, and yet you call us your own. You put your name upon us. Help us to hear your word. Help us, Father, to receive the expose of our own hearts that what is earthly might die and what does not belong to Christ might be put to death, that we might rise to new life in Christ, giving you praise and glory. In his name we pray, amen. I think every time I preach a sermon on a prophet, <laughs> I make the, the comment that we often don't really understand the ministry of the prophets, right? In, in our church culture, in, definitely in our culture, prophets are people who sort of tell the future in advance. Uh, but that's not really what the prophets do. Uh, now, they may dip into the future, but what they do is they speak to the people in light of God and his kingdom, in light of God's claims upon them, and in light of the response that the people either are or not giving to God. They're sort of like mediators between God and his people. Trying to, to, to get the people to understand who God is. So that they might turn from doing the wrong things and might turn unto God. Now God is the first prophet. And I, I don't mean, at least at this point, in some mysterious way. Uh, like Christ is the word of God and that sort of thing. I just simply mean, like, actually in history, God performs the function of a prophet. When Adam and Eve fall, it is God who pursues them and asks the question that is what all prophets are asking, where are you? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. That's a question we need to hear God asking of us. Where are you? That's what the prophets are interested in. And of course, that's not a question of condition, or a, it's not a question of location. It's not as if God doesn't know what precise location they are, even though they are foolishly trying to hide from him. It is a question of condition. It is a question of relationship to him. It is the opportunity for them to present themselves to him face to face. It is an opportunity for them to hear his voice and to say to God, here I am. That's what the prophets want. That's what God wants through the prophets. Now, they don't do that. Adam and Eve do not do that, right? They are hiding. And they are running. Uh, there has been a breach in the relationship between them and God. There has been the breakdown of love, the breakdown of trust, um, the a breakdown of the nakedness which they experienced when they were first created. There was the transparency of their relationship with God all of that now has been shattered. All of that has been broken. And they now hide. Remember, they sow the fig leaves, right? So they run right back to the place where they sinned uh, and try to cover themselves with whatever, you know, hide themselves with, with the, the leaves, the trees, all that sort of thing. And at the end of Genesis 3, we hear that God takes off their clothing, their fig leaves, and gives them a new covering. He doesn't want them to go through life covering themselves. He will do it. They need him to do it for them. Well, what are these clothes? Well, there's lots of answers to that. One way you could understand the clothes that God will provide for them 
is that this is sort of a statement of what God will be continually doing in the life of his people over and over and over and over again. I think we might read that story and just think like there's one specific thing. Like he took fig leaves away and he gave them animal clothing and like that's the end of the story. No, what really covers them is his presence. His words to them. It is his promises to them. It is his laws to them. It will be his prophets to them. And this is illustrated in the very next story. Cain and Abel. Right? So Cain and Abel come and they come to worship. And now God acts like something... If if in chapter 3 he acts like something of a a, a prophet, you might think of... Genesis 4, as God acting something like a pastor. Where he begins to probe Cain with questions again. Just like he probed Adam and Eve and their condition and their state. Where are you? He probes now Cain with questions. Right? The question uncovers how he will respond. It forces Cain to respond. And he can either respond in the right way or in the wrong way. Right? So you have questions that, that bring things to the surface. Um, it, it, God is acting like a pastor. He's trying to bring Cain from one point to another point. He can see sort of the destructive path that Cain is going down. Right? Remember his countenance has fallen. He can see that there is something wrong with him. And he wants to bring him from that place to a better place. And so he asks questions. He issues warnings to him. Cain is act or Cain. God is acting something like a pastor. Part of what God provides for us in our sin and in our shame and in our nakedness is for others to speak into our life. God provides people that care enough to say something to us. And so God intervenes into Adam and Eve's life. God intervenes into Cain and Abel's life. Even after Cain kills his brother, he intervenes again and covers Cain. Provides for him. So God's movement is, it's not just the end of Genesis 3 and that is the covering. You can just see God the way that he continues to do that. So by the time you get to Jeremiah, there is this long history of God using people to speak into the lives of his people. And Jeremiah is describing a shattered love, a broken communion, a destroyed relationship. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like Adam and Eve. That God's people have chosen something other than God. Just like Adam and Eve did. And the prophet comes, Jeremiah comes, against his will. (laughs) He does not want to be here. He doesn't want to be a prophet. He has begged God, please don't make me a prophet. It doesn't end well for prophets. Because when you meddle, (laughs) or when when you tinker in the lives of other people, when God calls you to do that, it doesn't go very well. And the prophet comes to Israel and says to Israel, where are you? In the first three verses of this chapter, he says, remember who you are. Right? The word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah, remember who you are. And then in verses 4 through 8, remember who I have been. That is the Lord, who the Lord has been the whole time. The way he has nourished and cared for and loved and carried them. To use the language of Genesis 3, the way way that he has clothed them from from the earliest moments of their existence. The goal is revealed in in chapter 3, return to me. And that's the word we want to hear is repent. Remember repent in, in this word, this Hebrew word, shuv, means to turn or to return. And the interesting thing about repentance is that is both of those things. 
It is to turn from one thing and then return unto God. And so if you read the bulletin, um, the email I sent out yesterday, these were the verses that were contained in there. Return or repent. Faithless Israel, declares the Lord, I will not look on you in anger for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree and that you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, it's the same word, return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. That's the goal. And in between the beginning, this is who you are, this is who God has been, and this is the goal, is, is God, through Jeremiah, very poignantly saying, and these are the games you play. When I ask the question, where are you? These are the games we play instead of answering the question. Seven times, you said, or you say, Instead of a life of turning and returning, a life of confession and repentance and humility, these are the games that we play. The first one is found in verse 20. In verse 20, instead of this open acknowledgement that they have shattered the relationship with God, uh, that they have broken this relationship Um, that they have rebelled against him, they, in verse 20, resolve to obey God. I will not serve other gods. I will do better. I won't do this again. I won't serve idols. Now, if if you were to extract that statement from from Jeremiah 2, that's a good statement, (laughs) right? That kind of resolve in a different context would be a commendable resolve, would be a good resolve, right? Just think of Joshua 24, choose this day whom you will serve. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? There, there is something commendable to that under normal circumstances. We want to serve the Lord. We vow to serve the Lord. But in this case... The prophet is exposing the, the, the propensity of the human heart, the propensity of even of God's people, when faced with the reality of their own sin, is, I'll do better. It's okay, I've got this. But as we read in chapter 3, what God wants is acknowledgement. He wants confession. And that is not confession. That isn't repentance. That isn't humility. When faced with conviction of sin, when faced with the confrontation of God saying, where are you? If your response is, well, I'll do better. I promise. I, I, I won't do that again. What you have done is you've, return, you've made your relationship with God into a transaction where you overcome the past by doing better in the present. You overcome your sin by your obedience. That's what they're trying to do. What's funny is we know how this works in human relationships. We know when people do this to us. When something happens and somebody somebody sins against us or some way, we can tell the difference between somebody who says, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I dishonored you. You deserve to be treated with respect, like whatever the situation is. You know the difference between that and is, I'll do better. Here's Here's some flowers. Here's some chocolates, right? Or whatever. I'll do better. Like Even in our human relationships, What you're doing is you're reducing that to a transaction where the chocolate and the flowers are somehow supposed to cancel out 
the sin you've just committed. And so as God says, where are you? Israel says, we'll do better. Well, verse 23, you move on because that doesn't work. It never works. We might feel better about ourselves for a little while. It certainly does not repair the relationship. You can't repair love by a transaction, an exchange of present obedience for past failures. The second thing and we resort to is just a refusal to acknowledge guilt, verse 23. A denial of the sin. Which is ironic because there may even be a progression that Jeremiah is saying. The irony is, I'll do better, which is kind of an acknowledgement of the sin. And then the next stage is, yeah, it's, it's actually not that bad. We refuse to acknowledge our sin before the Lord and others. In, in terms of the, what Jeremiah says, they say, I am not unclean. I have not sinned. I'm not guilty. You see, sin does the old one-two on us. It twists us up. I mean, think about that. If, you, if, if somebody were to pull you aside and you were just having a normal conversation apart from sin, apart from some offense that you've committed to somebody, and you said, especially in a Reformed church, like, are you a sinful person? Like, oh, man, yeah, I'm so sinful, man. I don't serve the Lord very well. Like, I... I I say the wrong things, I do the wrong things, like I want to, but I, I, right? Like we acknowledge it. But what happens when we actually sin and somebody calls us to account on that particular sin? We start playing games about it. In this case, we're like, well, no, I mean, I'm not that bad. I'm not unclean. There, there's something irrational about it. And that's what sin does. It, sin makes us irrational. It doesn't make any sense we resolve to do better, but then we deny that we had done anything wrong in the first place. And the goal is the same. It is to make ourselves feel better about ourselves rather than to actually deal with the sin. But that is a cycle you cannot live under for very long. It is an impossible cycle. It is a death-creating cycle. And so verse 25 reveals like what's sort of next. It just moves to just pure, sheer resignation of sin. I can't do anything else. I'm a terrible person. There's no hope for me. I might as well give in. I am who I am. Here, Jeremiah, Jeremiah reveals that sin just wears us down. Sin hardens our heart. When there isn't a confession of it, when there isn't the ownership of it, what happens is there becomes the hardening of the heart where the sin defines you and you become hopeless. There can come a time where we simply say, it's just the way that I am. We shrug our shoulders in resignation and acceptance of sin. Verse 27 moves beyond that <laughs> where, so you, you resolve to do better. You reject that you're actually sinful and did the sin or whatever. Maybe you get hopeless. The next one is, God, just save me. Like, get this over with, verse 27. Arise and save us. Right, this is what Saul did to Samuel when he didn't, um, do what God had told him to do. He's like, shh, shh, like, let's keep this under wraps. Let's keep this between me and you. Take me to the temple and let's worship and you say everything is okay. Can't God just save me? Like, what, what Saul was asking for is just like, let's get this over with. Let's get this passed. Come on, hurry up. Let's get this done. And again, this in, in another context... Right? Save us. Hosanna. Lord, save us. Is great. In this context, it's not. 
Lord, I just need a quick fix. I just want this to go away. I want to stop feeling bad. Let's just move past this. Let's forget it happened. God, come and save me. Of course, God mocks them. Where are the things you trusted in? Let them come and save you. (laughs) Where are those gods you made that you call Father? Let them come and save you. Let's see them resolve this. Verse 28. Verse 31 moves even further. In verse 31, the sinful heart, when when confronted with the question, where are you, and its refusal to answer that question, convinces itself that we're actually better off for not following the Lord in the first place. We hold back our life. We do our own thing. It's sort of like a resolved rebellion. We no longer allow God to see who we really are. We run away from him rather than to him. We turn our back to him rather than our faces to him. And then we believe that this is the freedom we were looking for all along. But it is the bondage and the slavery and the corruption which we're trapped in. Verse 35, there is another one. I told you there were seven of these. There is the rationalization of it. I am innocent. I have not sinned. The Lord isn't displeased with me. When you tell God what he is and what he isn't, you've crossed lines. (laughs) If you are the one who determines that, you have crossed lines. Here is the prophet <laughs> ringing forth God's word. No, God isn't displeased with us. And we know this will work its way all the way out through Jeremiah when he goes into the temple and the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, right? They will, they will, that will manifest it like there's no way God could be just, dis- we're his people, the temple's right there. Like, there's no way. We do, this, we do this sort of thing all the time. We rationalize our sin and our choices. They're not as bad as they are, and certainly God doesn't really care all that much. We weave a narrative where we are fine, and we don't feel the hand of God against us. Right? That's what Israel is saying. From the beginning, God comes and asks the question, where are you? And there are some people who answer that question. There are some people who, through the shame and through the pain of answering that question, look at God. That is repentance. Repentance begins with and is characterized by honesty before God. It is a willingness to hear the prophetic voice in our lives. Now that prophetic voice can be just the spirit with conviction. It can be the word of God you're reading. It can be the preaching. It can be your spouse. It can be your children. It can, God's voice can manifest itself in all kinds of ways. The repentant heart listens to whatever, whatever vehicle God is using to speak into our lives, the, the, the repentant heart listens and receives it. Or at least it tries to. A willingness to hear the word through others. And not respond with phony resolutions for past sins, for refusals to acknowledge guilt, or resignations to failure and to hopelessness, that's just who I am, or begging God, please just fix this and make it go away, or running from the Lord, or rationalizing choices. Like, if you were to uncover what's underneath Jeremiah, right? So he's not dealing with this. 
He's just saying, like, this is how Israel responds. What is underneath these responses? What, what keeps us from answering the question, where are you? You probably know it in your own heart. I can think of a few. Pride. Right? Who are you to tell me anything? Right? That's reasonable. You can imagine Israel looking at poor Jeremiah. Who are you? We're above it. We're above the voice of God. We're above the voice of the scriptures. We're above our spouse. We're above our friends. We're above what, whatever vehicle God might be using to speak to us. We're just above it. Right? That's a reasonable reason why we don't listen. Shame is another reason. We would just as soon, like Adam and Eve, hide from God. Shame is powerful. Shame is a force in our lives. Where we just heap layer upon layer upon layer so no one actually sees us, not even God. Hurt. Now, pride, shame, and hurt, like these aren't, like they're not separate. Like they are just simply articulations. Is shame hurts? <laughs> it feels awful. And so I don't want to feel that way. And so I reject it. I think one of the reasons why we have a hard time just sort of turning directly face to face with God, especially when he's asking us the question, where are you, is because we don't really trust him. We don't really trust his character. We have not resolved, or that's not the right term. We have not been convinced of how much God actually loves us. The way to repentance is to trust his grace and mercy. He has turned to us first. It is his face that he shows to us. We have to trust his grace and his mercy. We are way worse than we know. Like you think it's bad when the prophet comes and tells you how bad you are. That's not even scratching the surface of the reality of our own hearts. We are clearly worse than we are willing to admit. Jeremiah is demonstrating that, proving that. But the Lord is more merciful, more gracious, and more loving than you can possibly imagine. More than you can even think possible. The only way that you can truly know the love and mercy and goodness of Christ or of God is to look at the face of Jesus. Look at the way Jesus dealt with sinners in the Gospels. Look at the way he shows his face in the cross where he offers himself in love for you. And remember this, Jesus is everything God is and can be for you. Jesus is everything God is and can be for us. As Paul says, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When you put those two things together, 
that we are actually worse than we know, but God is better than we believe possible. I think Tim Keller, I think that's one of Tim Keller's most famous uh, little phrases. He has a whole bunch of them. Uh, maybe some of you know Tim better than I do, but uh, that's one that I remember. Uh, I don't remember what book it was from. I'm sure it's about in every book he writes, but when you put those two things together, that produces true repentance. Like that leads to a turning of our face to meet God's face. So Psalm 51 says this, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. It's not what you're looking for. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. Not for sin, right? Remember, he's dealing with sin. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Verses 16 and 17. That's when I understand who I am, at least in some measure, and I understand who God is. That's when those two things meet. That is a broken and a contrite heart. That is the path to knowing the love of God. That is the path to experiencing his kingdom. So I'm, I'm thinking of John the Baptist where he's like, repent, the kingdom is here. Like, how do we experience that kingdom in our own life? It's when those two things meet and we walk in the life and the freedom and the joy and the peace of forgiveness and life and blessing. When God's face shines upon us and our face is radiant before him. Repentance is the path to that. Repentance leads and prepares us for that. And the rest is all just good news. May God give us the grace of repentance. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Our God, we bless you for the promise of the Holy Spirit. For he is the promised one to come. The comforter, the counselor, the one who brings conviction, the one who persuades concerning your love and goodness, concerning Jesus Christ, but also concerning our own sin. So that we might, through the shame, the pain, and the difficulty of answering the question that you ask of us, where are you, we might find life, we might find ourselves in Jesus Christ. We might find ourselves in your kingdom, forgiven and washed, delivered and healed, rescued and saved, receiving peace and joy and life and love. We thank you for your spirit's work. We thank you for the various ways in which you speak into our life. Father, forgive us if we turn a deaf ear, no matter where your voice is heard, no matter where it comes from. Forgive us, Lord, when we are both unaware and if we are aware where we turn a deaf ear to it. For whatever reason, open up our ears, open up our hearts to receive you, to hear you, and then to respond with the deep, broken spirit and contrite heart and humility that you ask of us. May your name be praised and worshipped because you rescue us and you deliver us though we were the ones who broke the relationship. We were the ones who transgressed your love. We were the ones who chose death over life. Who chose ourselves over you. And yet you have done everything you can to show pity and mercy upon us. Praise be to the Father. Praise be to the Son. Praise be to the Spirit of glory. Amen.
Well, let's respond. Let's cry out to God, cry out to Christ. Let's do that by singing him 503, out of my bondage, sorrow and night, I come to thee. 503, let's stand together. continue to worship with gifts and offerings.
stand again? And let's pray. Our God, we rejoice because you bless those who bless you. You sanctify those who trust in you. Save your people. Bless your inheritance. Protect your church. We thank you that you are the lover of mankind, the benefactor of our souls with every good gift, and that today you have made even us worthy of your heavenly and immortal life. Make straight our paths, protect our lives, secure our steps before you. Grant peace to your world and to your churches and to all people. For all good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from you, the Father of lights. And to you we give glory, together with your Son and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever.